Good morning, fellow Scots. I'm Jeff Rankin. I'm editor of Monmouth College Magazine and the campus historian. And I'd like to welcome you to Scott's Day at Monmouth College. It's a beautiful, sunny spring day here at Monmouth. And I uh, want to uh, thank you very much for tuning in early. I've been asked to kind of reminisce about Scott's Day through the years, whether you attended Monmouth in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. Uh, you all remember spring on campus, and it's a different time now. Uh, we still have, of course, people on campus, but it's, it's not quite as uh, uh, it might have been in springs past, but we're looking forward to next year and having the campus back in full uh, motion and things going uh, like, like you remember it. But Monmouth um, really has an interesting history of, of the spring and the rites of spring. And Scott's Day, actually the, the, the actual name Scott's Day, didn't really even come into being until 1982. That was the first uh, actual Scott's Day. But really the, uh, the, the, the spirit of what Scott's Day was uh, goes clear back to the 1890s. And there, the first uh, real event that was held that we know of was in 1896. And it was a spring, it was called a May party, and it happened in the auditorium. And in those days, there was a ban on fraternities and sororities, uh, but we did have literary societies. So the two women's literary societies, the Eleutherian and ABL, which was, uh, it stood for the French, Amitou de Bellet, which meant lover of beautiful letters, uh, they staged in the auditorium a, a May party. And this included uh, dances and also the winding of the Maypole. And this proved to be very popular. Uh, it was really for the women primarily, and the idea was to honor the senior women. Uh, but men uh, also didn't want to be left out, so they started some of their own traditions. And one of those was called the Night Shirt Parade. And this would happen the night before the May party. And the men would gather in front of Wallace Hall in their night shirts back then. Everybody wore night shirts. And they would parade through town. And usually they would have a band. And they would go uh, looking for food and stop at faculty's houses and serenade them. And uh, it was a grand old time. And then the, the next morning, uh, eventually, uh, it, it became sort of a tradition. The male students and the male faculty would vote for the May Queen. And the May Queen would be uh, coronated. And uh, eventually, it was too big for the auditorium, so they moved it outside. And they moved it to a place called the Valley Beautiful. And this was uh, a natural valley uh, just south of McMichael Dorm. And it originally, there was a creek, creek running through that area. So it was a, a natural depression. And there was a, a bank uh, in the back. Uh, where there used to be a bridge. It was, it was where the Kappa Bridge was, where the Kappas were founded. Uh, but anyway, it made a great uh, sort of natural amphitheater with the uh, a backdrop behind it. And the women would gather in front of Wallace Hall, and they would uh, parade in costume, very elaborate costume, uh, down into the Valley Beautiful. And this would be like at dusk, and they would have the uh, big ceremonies uh, beginning uh, before sundown. And it, it became, uh, every year, even more, more um, elaborate. Uh, they would, it would become part of the women's physical education curriculum. And in those days, there was a gymnasium on the top floor of McMichael Hall. And that is where the women would practice their dancers, dances. And they would bring an instructor from Burlington to come and teach them these dances. And they'd work for weeks on costumes and a lot of times they would have themes where they would wear, oh, say, Japanese uh, kimonos, or they might, uh, one year they, they did Native American garb, and, they, and there would be different groups that would come and do different dances. And it, this was highly anticipated, and really it was a whole community event. There would be thousands of people eventually coming to the, to the May party, and they would have young uh, children uh, be the attendants uh, for the queen. And actually, there would be a junior woman who was selected in advance. She'd be the maid of honor. 
and then uh, they would not announce the queen until the last minute and she would reign and then the whole ceremony would always end with the wrapping of the maypole and this continued um, it continued to evolve through the 20s and took on the name may fet f-e-t-e and um, eventually they added a male counterpart the chancellor and and the, the, he, he would be the consort of the queen and uh, he would also be voted on by the student body and it was a it was a big deal it was a very um, you know it was a, a big honor at the time it was kind of like homecoming queen this was you know it actually began in the days before homecoming even existed so uh, as I said every year this would uh, sort of evolve into different uh, uh, kinds of um, celebrations and then there were other things that happened at the same time uh, a lot of time and, and once the fraternities got reinstated in the 20s they would have fraternity sings and they would do that them in the Valley Beautiful as well and that evolved and eventually it became Scott sing and a lot of you probably participated in that it was you know a competition among the different uh, Greek organizations uh, today we still do it and we call it Scott White and it's it's a lot of fun and so that would be another thing that would be done and then uh, as we got into the 30s and 40s Gracie Peterson who many of you know would have an elaborate uh, stage show at the Wrigley Theater and that would be in the spring also and that would involve um, elaborate musical numbers and costumes and all that sort of thing so all these things were kind of a way to welcome spring and shake off the awful Midwest winters and just uh, really uh, let loose. Now, World War II kind of put a, a damper on things. Uh, the May Fet became, uh, went on hiatus. Uh, the fraternities uh, all, uh, sort of ceased to exist because all the men were at war. So we didn't do the Scots sing or any of, the, any of that. So when the war was over, okay, there was a big uh, push to get college back the way it used to be. So they brought back the May Fed as soon as they could, and that was about 1948. And at this time, there was a parking lot where the Valley Beautiful was. So they decided to move it to a field uh, also in a valley uh, on the other side of Wallace Hall Hill, so it was just south of the gymnasium, and it made a nice little amphitheater, and they used the gymnasium as a backdrop. But again, they would do the elaborate dances. They'd have the, the, the queen and the, and the chancellor uh, crowned, and they would walk down the hill um, down to a stage. And in 1949, the chancellor was Harold Red Poling, and he had been a uh, naval cadet here during World War II. And after the war, he was from Virginia. He decided he wanted to come back and enroll at Monmouth College. And we're glad he did because he went on to become the CEO of the Ford Motor Company. And we have the former Carnegie Library was renovated uh, through his gift and named after him. And it's now called Polling Hall. So Red Polling was the uh, chancellor. And you, some of you may have known Dorothy Kern Benke, uh, Monmouth, longtime Monmouth resident. She was his queen. So that was a very memorable time. And this kind of continued. Um, in, through the early 50s and by that time uh, things were started changing you know the, the May Day and all that and the Maypole were becoming sort of a thing of the past uh, so really the spring formal became sort of the new thing for spring and uh, that you would have of course the king and the queen and they would have a big dance um, so that kind of continued and then uh, eventually uh, there became sort of a need for Students wanted to let loose and they wanted to have a skip day so they would like not show up for classes. Well, that didn't go over too well with the faculty. So uh, that didn't, didn't last too long. But uh, in the 60s, um, they, uh, they, the fraternities kind of wanted to get together and do more things. And 1963 was when the new uh, student center was finished. And they hired as the first student center director young man named Ralph Whiteman from the class of 1951. Uh, Ralph was uh, you know, a long time uh, Monmouth family, uh, very active, very uh, innovative. And so he decided along with the opening of the student center, uh, we would do some fun spring stuff and thus the Scott Olympics were born. And um, 
Ralph Ice could come up with some really interesting ideas. And in those days, before we had an organization like the, the Association for Student Activity Programming or whatever, uh, there was a, a student center board and it was very active and, and you know, it was an honor to be uh, elected to that. But they were very um, uh, instrumental working with Ralph in uh, doing all kinds of fun activities. So they were naturals to get the Scott Olympics off the ground. And so um, there was always the Monmouth Knox relays in the spring that was a big deal. And so it was going to kind of revolve around the, the, the relays. And at that time, they, they did uh, crown the, the queen and king uh, at the relays. So it made sense. And so Ralph uh, came up with some interesting Olympic style games and the old uh, cinder track that used to circle the uh, football field would be a great place for bike races. And one year uh, he wanted to echo the uh, six day track uh, uh, bicycle race in France. And so for six days leading up to uh, the relays, uh, he had bicycles going day and night. The uh, women would ride until 7 p.m. and then the men would take over overnight. And it was a crazy time. And Ralph at the time lived right next to the athletic field. So he would have sometimes have to come out in his pajamas to uh, quiet the crowd down because the neighbors weren't uh, too appreciative of that. Um, but for one of the openings, uh, Ralph decided he would have parachuters uh, come down and, uh, and kick the thing off. And so he had two, two of them uh, and they, they, they dropped a, a streamer down to see how the wind was. It landed right on the 50 yard line. They jumped out of the plane and as they got with close to the ground, the wind blew them off course and they landed a couple of blocks to the west in the mayor's garden and on the roof of a house. So that, you know, there was always something that seemed to be happening uh, with, with, with Ralph saying one year he got the state uh, midget car racer champion uh, to, to provide the pace uh, car with all of his, its, uh, his uniform crew. They got ready at the starting uh, flag and uh, the uh, pace uh, car champion couldn't get his car started. So these are all uh, fun things that happened. And, uh, one of the memorable um, activities they did was a, they had a mud pit and each of the organizations had a little symbol of their organization in the mud and they all had to dive in and find their organization's uh, symbol. So that was another fun thing. But they always did things like your traditional, they did wheelbarrow uh, relay races, they did egg tosses, pie uh, in the face type things, pie eating. Um, and it was great fun. And uh, they were always looking for uh, new things based on sort of like social trends. So in 1966, the big thing at, in the spring of 66 was the ABC TV show Batman. And everybody was all into Batman. It was, it was uh, you know, uh, sort of really, the culture was, it was kind of crazy. But uh, they decided they would, uh, for to choose the queen, they would uh, actually have a bat uh, theme and they were going to name her um, Vampira Queen of the Bats. And so they took pictures of all the uh, nominees and they sent them off to Batman, to Adam West in Hollywood, and he became the judge. And so he named Sandra Wade from the class of 67 uh, Vampira Queen of the Bats. And so these were the, the types of things that went on in the 60s. Uh, by the early 70s, uh, things got a little more serious. You know, we had Vietnam, we had uh, the, the college uh, enrollment was dipping, uh, we had the oil crisis. It was just one thing after another, inflation, and you know, people in Watergate. And so there was a, a more seriousness, but also uh, there was sort of this uh, uh, anti-war and flower power thing going on. So college campuses nationwide were doing a thing called Festival of Life, and these would be sort of all-night events uh, outside with bands and uh, you know kind of a Woodstock atmosphere. So Monmouth did a Festival of Life, and um, they, they actually were going to do one out in front of Wallace Hall, and then they were worried that the police kind of uh, came in, so they moved it into the gym. They didn't want it going all night. Um, but, but these kind of things continued. 
Um, one year they, uh, you know, had some pretty, pretty uh, big bands. I mean, they had um, REO Speedwagon and the Ides of March. Um, I think it was in 1974, they decided to combine the Scott Olympics with the Festival of Life and they called it the Festival Olympics. So, uh, you know, it was uh, held out in People's Park and they had the, they had uh, movies shown on the big screen and they had bands. And so it was a, you know, it was a fun time. 74 was also, some of you may remember uh, Ray Stevens' song, The Streak. Uh, it was a big streaking uh, fad at the time, and uh, in this in April there was a actual weekend that became known as Streakers Weekend, and it was uh, nationwide. But it happened at Monmouth too, and uh, there would be streakers running from Gibson Hall uh, up to uh, the back of Winbigler Hall, and so that was uh, you know also a, a fun time. Um, so the 70s kind of ended on a, on a crazy note, you know, things were just uh, kind of crazy nationwide. Um, the 80s uh, brought on a little more uh, seriousness. Uh, President Bruce Haywood was inaugurated in 1980. And um, so students were kind of looking to, I mean, they kind of wanted to do tradition, but they also wanted to do some new things. And, and they did, the Student Association came up with the idea of Scott's Day. And basically, uh, it would be a day when the uh, classes would be canceled, but it was a big secret. Nobody knew it was going to happen. And the only way you knew was that the Highlander bagpipers would, would parade through the residence halls and fraternity houses beginning at 7 a.m. and waking everybody up. And they would uh, all proceed, once they were awake, to Wallace Hall Plaza for breakfast in their pajamas. Um, and there, they would sign up for events uh, during the day uh, they did some kind of interesting events. One, they did a scavenger hunt once, and they would tie three students and two faculty members together, and they would have to go off and do a scavenger hunt to look for prizes, uh, which I can imagine would have been uh, challenging, <laughs> but, uh, but still nonetheless fun. And um, so, and then it, it continued to evolve. They, they would do more things like, you know, throughout the day, fun things, uh, jello wrestling and uh, tug of wars and you know they continued the Scott Olympics kind of things with chariot races and uh, building human pyramids and all that sort of good stuff and this kind of uh, became I mean this was really what a lot of you remember as Scott's Day it was just a day of fun uh, Knox College does a similar thing and they still do it and they call it flunk day um, but it's everything's basically canceled it's just a day to really uh, you know let loose uh, they also would have softball games between faculty and students, and you know it was just um, it was just a fun time. But you know there were also uh, uh, negative things associated with it: um, a lot of partying, a lot of drinking, and um, you know faculty and administration weren't necessarily thrilled with all that because it was you know the possibility that things could go wrong. So in the early 90s, uh, they decided um, they wanted to curb this a bit and they decided to change it to Scott's Weekend so it would not inter interfere with classes. Uh, faculty didn't like the idea of classes being canceled, you know, uh, unexpectedly. So they tried Scott's Weekend and it was okay, but it really, uh, it wasn't the same. And so uh, 1994, 95, um, after President Haywood retired. Sue Huseman was the new president, and she decided she would come in um, with a sort of a, an idea to uh, create community. That was sort of her theme, and part of that was uh, go, getting back to our Scottish roots. So she decided we would have uh, Scots Day tied to our heritage, and this included, they called it the Flatland Games. It was, it was like Highland, Highland Games in, in Monmouth, they would do uh, the caber toss and uh, tug of war, different Scottish uh, traditions. Um, they also would take a bus trip out to South Henderson Church near Gladstone, which was where the college was founded, and you know different bagpiping things, and so that was a lot of fun. And then um, it, it continued after uh, Sue Huseman was only here three years. Um, 
and President Yeesey came in. Uh, they, they still continued to do the Scottish games and um, it, it sort of uh, became um, a, a bigger part of the, of the spring, kind of a, a formal part of, um, of the tradition, the academic year. Classes would be canceled. Uh, there would be an honors convocation in the morning. And um, after that, things just it became fun. And out, outdoors, uh, they would do the Scottish things. Uh, we, for a time, they called it Kaylee, which is the, the Celtic uh, word for a, for a festival. Uh, they would still do a lot of the, the Scottish games, but they'd also do, uh, they brought in inflatable uh, games and uh, that sort of thing. So that, that all continued throughout the, the 2000s. Then, um, you know, but there were always times when the weather got bad, so they would have to move the, the games inside into the gym. And so I think it was in 2012, they uh, started a, a new idea. And this was, uh, let's get away from, you know, the sort of flunk day kind of thing. Let's, let's uh, give it a more academic uh, uh, note. Um, let's celebrate that we're a college. And so uh, they added a scholarship luncheon after, uh, after the honors convocation. They'd bring the scholarship donors to campus and they would eat with their students. And that, that was really kind of a neat thing. And then they, um, in the afternoon, they started uh, doing uh, academically oriented activities. And they would have performances, theater performances and uh, poster sessions. And they would, uh, uh, you know, bring out, show, you know, demonstrate um, different kinds of um, uh, like uh, lab projects they were working on and that sort of thing. And so it was kind of a hybrid. Uh, they still did the games and the, the fun stuff, but they also kind of wanted to celebrate academics. And then it wasn't long after that, they decided, well, let's just call this Scholars Day. Let's not call it Scott's Day. Uh, and because they wanted to really emphasize the scholarly aspect. So that, that kind of happened. And uh, so Scott's, the name Scott's Day was kind of hanging there in limbo. So uh, 19, uh, 19, or 2017, uh, the idea came that we would do a day of giving. And so uh, they kicked around a lot of names and, and ideas. And this name Scott's Day kept resurfacing because uh, we wanted to really uh, focus on our heritage on that day and, you know, spring and the fun times. And so it just seemed like we had to bring back Scott's Day. So we called it Scott's Day of Giving. And, for the, and it's already become a tradition. And in five years, uh, we have uh, seen it uh, uh, expand and, and, and raise a lot of funds, I think over $800,000 over that period of time. Uh, just in the 18 hours and 53 minutes that the uh, that that the clock is winding, and it, it's a it's been interesting the last two years with with the, the shutdowns and the pandemic, we've still been able to do it, which technology has made that happen. It would never would have obviously happened before uh, in the in the 90s or the 80s or any time like that. So uh, in a way, that's fortunate, um, but we still uh, we have. In addition to our Scots Day of Giving, we still have our, our what we call Scholars Day, and that is will be next week. It, it still isn't back up to completely normal, but we do have um, our, our traditional honors convocation. Um, and next year, when we're back to normal, we'll do a full day of activities, and it'll be great. So uh, that just, that's kind of in a nutshell, 130 some years of Scott's Day at Monmouth College in the spring. And um, I, you know, I hope that uh, we reawaken some memories for you. Uh, we'd love to hear your memories if you had specific things that, that really stand out uh, in your past and, and your fondness of your Monmouth experience. But, uh, you know, we're just happy that we're, we're still able to go during the pandemic and, um, you know, the technology allows us to reminisce and, and think back on how, you know, how far we've come and how far we, we're continuing to, to expand through, uh, through days like the Scott's Day of Giving. We got some shout outs from 86 and 87 and 2000. 
And we have some updates for you. Yeah, forty percent on the goal and three thirty donors. Three hundred and thirty donors. That's great, and, and we're up to forty percent. So uh, you know, keep uh, keep us uh, on all day on your on your uh, computer, on your phone, and keep uh, watching, seeing the, the progress. Uh, we, we'll have uh, matches going on throughout the day, uh, special um, little uh, segments that you'll find interesting and bring you up to date on what's going on on campus. We've got some really interesting challenges, but we've got some projects that are important. Uh, we have the Champion Miller 1860 Fund to help uh, in increase our diversity on campus. And we have um, the Scott's Care uh, Fund to help people through uh, these challenging times. We have, uh, for all you athletes, we know you know, there's a lot of uh, athletic supporters out there. Uh, the Fighting Scott Society is always uh, doing some uh, really neat things to help uh, expand our, our really great athletics program, which has continued to operate uh, pretty well despite the pandemic, and we're ready for that to really uh, take off again. We always have the Monmouth Fund, uh, which is really critical. It's, it's what brings, uh, sort of helps uh, bridge the gap between what it costs to actually uh, educate a student and what they can afford to pay. So the, you know, there's things throughout the day. Uh, the Parents Fund is, is working on a, a Wi-Fi hotspot on campus. And there's just all kinds of needs and ways for you to get involved and for you to uh, you know, uh, celebrate your Scotthood. <laughs> it's, a, it's a day when we all can kind of come together and be proud of, of the Monmouth tradition and that we were a part of it and continue to be a part of it. Looks like the class of 1994 has been challenged. So oh. we're looking at you, 94. Class of 94, all right. <laughs> Get out there, do it. And then we got a comment um, that they honored and uh, made a gift in honor of Coach Brewer. So I want to give a shout out to Audrey Hall and that family. Wonderful. We're thinking of him today. Right. We've, we've lost some of our really greats in the past year, and that was a particularly hard one, uh, losing such a popular coach to COVID. And, uh, you know, let's, let's honor his, his great work at Monmouth and not let, let it be forgotten. Absolutely. And uh, Tartan Nation, where are we on state? Do we have any? We have uh, North Carolina, Illinois, South Dakota, New York. So we have about 26 left. Okay, well, wherever you are, if you're out there in Iowa or Texas or Alaska, uh, wherever you happen to be, I know you may not be awake yet on the West Coast, but uh, if you're on the East Coast, uh, you know, help us fill out our map with, with the tartan. Uh, you know, we're, we've, we've done it every year. We've, we've colored in the 50 states, and we look to do that again this year. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. You are an amazing wealth of knowledge with Mama Scholar. Thank you. I enjoyed speaking with you and look forward to having you back on campus when things open up again. And, and we'll uh, be glad to give you a, a tour, a history tour, or whatever you like. And, uh, you know, we, we love Mama College. We love our history. Thanks, Doc.